Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Latest Shiny Podcast. With me today is uh, Rob Hirschwald, as usual. Hey, Rob, how are you? Hello, Stephen. And today's guest, and I know every time I announce the guest, I get excited and tell you how great they are, but this, is, this has got to be one of my favorite guests of all time. And, and it was a great honor in my year at Rackspace working with uh, Jim Plamondon. And we've tracked Jim all the way down in Cambodia to join us. And uh, their internet is working probably a little better than ours here in America. So, Jim, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. And uh, you flatter me, sir. <laughs> so, Jim, before we kick in, why don't you uh, do quickly, I know that might be a little difficult, just a quick overview of um, your role in basically creating the whole concept of developer evangelism and platforms with APIs and uh, give people a little history. And then we'll start digging into some of the amazing things that uh, we all take for granted right now that you came up with. Well, I would say that I, I polished one side of a cog in a very big machine. Uh, so at Microsoft, I was just a little tiny, you know, one side of a cog in a very big machine. You don't realize that until you leave a really big company and try to do a startup and you realize all the things you don't know, all the things that other people at the big company were taking care of that you didn't even see, like payroll, right? Like fundraising, finances, and all that kind of stuff, which you realize overwhelms a small company. And the amount of time you have to do the thing you did that you were enabled to totally focus on at a bigger company really shrinks and impedes your ability to do that good work. So I have a lot more respect for guys like Bill Gates, you know, Steve Jobs, who were able to make, to take their companies from small little startups all the way to big companies while still retaining control. That's freaking amazing. Okay. And still doing a good job. So my humility quotient has been way up since a couple of startup failures. <laughs> so as to APIs and so forth, I, I was a Mac developer. Uh, I, I got into development with a Macintosh back in the phone book edition of Inside Mac Days. Before you could even buy a Mac, you could buy this um, manual that was printed on really thin paper that had all the APIs that looked like a phone book. And I studied that before the computer even came out and talked my girlfriend at the time, who later became my wife, into buying a Mac. So I totally got into object-oriented programming and all that stuff pretty early, uh, mid-80s, mid to late 80s, and started a developer release. Well, I started a developer's association focused on Mac app, the first commercially successful object-oriented application framework, and held meetings at Microsoft or at Apple's campus that we videotaped and distributed videotapes to other Mac developer groups around the U.S. and the world because I could get great speakers in Silicon Valley and most places couldn't. It wasn't because I was special, I just happened to be in the right spot. Um, but I always wrote up the meeting notes as if they were awesome! If you didn't come, you missed the most amazing presentations in the world! And so that was fun. Uh, and I did a bunch of stuff like that and that brought me to Microsoft's attention and they said, hey, we should hire this guy to romance the Mac community. And so they brought me up for a bunch of job interviews and I basically told them, Microsoft's developer relations was non-existent. You know, I'd never heard of it, that what little they did was fucked in the head. Um, that Apple, on the other hand, was doing many things right, but many things wrong. And here was a list, and here's how my, uh, Apple, or rather Microsoft, I'm getting confused between the two, how Microsoft could take the best of both worlds. Joined up, I had the enviable position of, while I was working on Olay 2 and, and various other things, I was interviewing all the new hires and, uh, and then uh, reviewing their evangelism plans. And so I treated each evangelism campaign as an experiment to learn what worked in technology evangelism. And then I taught classes inside Microsoft to the new evangelists on how to do evangelism effectively. And I can talk about this because the notes from those classes got entered into the public record in a couple of anti-Microsoft or Microsoft antitrust suits, right? Where uh, the judges deemed that Microsoft's application barrier to entry, that its suite of third-party applications was so extensive that it constituted a, a barrier to entry to competitors. Which of course we knew at Microsoft, that's why we went out of our way to build so many apps and to make it easy for our competitors to build apps and gave the tools away for free so they could build apps and all that stuff. But, but I think, uh, Jim, 
the name. I'm sorry, am I boring you to death here? So no, I was just, no, this is, I, no, I was, this is great. Old. I was going to say, I mean, you, the Plamundin files, or are they the Plamundin papers that they're referred to? I mean, well, they are referred to once as the Plamondon files. Um, my brother Peter, who was still active in the industry, was not pleased about that. <laughs> that his name. But, was, but, I, but I do know you can go look up the Plamondon files, and it was the whole central part of the you know, Microsoft Monopoly case. I mean, come on, you can't be more famous right. than that. I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, it is, it is a two-sided uh, coin, shall we say. There's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it's one of those, it's a sword with no handle. You know, you're holding on to the blade as you, as you poke somebody else with it. Um, so, it's a very thin line between famous and infamous. At the, that's right, okay. yeah. And my particular claim to fame was um, working with hostile communities uh, where First, I went into the Mac community, where I had come from, and evangelized Mac developers to join the Windows platform, which, of course, was anathema to them. They had been raised to believe that Microsoft was evil. Apple always needs an evil target. First, it was IBM, right? Because it's easy to rally the tribe against foreign threats. Okay? If you don't have a foreign enemy, you tend to argue about each other. Right. Look at American politics today, right? Once the Soviet Union is vanquished, the two leading parties turned on each other, okay? And America's been tearing itself apart ever since. Um, it's the same with the Apple community, right? As long as they were attacking IBM, or defending themselves from an IBM attack, or defending themselves from Microsoft, they were doing great. Uh, once they gained a relatively high position, the uh, market innovation, so we say, has slowed way down. Now they're copying Samsung instead of the other way around. But, but so. they don't have an enemy anymore, do they? I mean, is their enemy themselves? Because they're so well, big. In terms of raw market share, Android is totally dominating Apple. And in the long run, that's going to do the same thing to the iOS that Windows domination did to Mac OS. Okay. Now, in the short run, the, the, they are make, they're doing exactly the same thing they did with the Mac in the early days. The profit per Mac was so high because to get the Mac OS, you had to buy the Mac hardware because it was not licensed to anyone. And so it, it was as if they were charging $1,000 for the Mac operating system on top of a normal price for PC hardware. And that was great until Windows caught up so that you didn't have to pay that much for that functionality anymore. I once did a, a study where Apple, Microsoft, Apple had done a study of System 7 or whatever it is versus Windows 3.0 or maybe even 3.1. Uh, and the study task, uh, how long did it take to open a file? How long did it take to create a new file? How long did it take to do this, to change a form, to do the other thing? All of these very user-centric tasks. And they hired a third-party agency to actually execute the tasks to make it look you know, legit and independent. And they hired a different company to uh, oversee the tasks. Right. So when, when Windows 95 was about to come out, I hired that same company that same independent contractor to execute precisely the same set of tests that Apple had used. I didn't even fudge the tests, okay? Exactly the same suite of tests, exactly the same specifications. And Windows 95 kicked the Mac's ass on the tests that Apple had defined to be the metrics of user friendliness and usability, okay? Think about that for a minute. I actually right. remember when that came out. That's the message. Yeah. Yes. And what I love about talking to you, Jim, is that, is that I can go back to, to these, these pivotal events or these, these pivotal marketing campaigns in, 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 his, in my career history and be talking to the person who was the mastermind behind it. It's so, fascinating. One of the great things about the PC industry is that we're all still alive, by and large. The mainframe hardware business, some of those guys are dead now, right? Many computers, most of them are still around, but the PC business is just not old enough for everybody who died of old age yet. Okay, I got gray hair, a little older than the average forest. But a very distinguished but, mustache, which I wish yeah, I'm a very distinguished in the mustache. podcast notes. That's right, okay. Um, what, screen grab from this or what? <laughs> we'll see. I may have to send you something else, but anyway. Um, so yeah, it is, it is fascinating to talk to the people behind the scenes once they're two or three companies away, and they're much more willing to open up, because uh, the ramifications of opening up are, are so much less than they were before. 
the, the thing, the thing that I can't help thinking about as I listen to this though, is that we could easily just substitute the names for the companies with open source project names or, sure. uh, you know, you could, you could throw the, these same dynamics, these same questions, the same struggle for, um, you know, mind share in a community is just the same as what we saw just shake out around the Kubernetes versus the other yep. container infrastructure platforms, right? Is between Amazon and Microsoft and Google on cloud, um, right? These are these are universal truths from a from a from a marketing perspective, let alone a tech marketing perspective. So I realized something about uh, 2007, 2008 during the great economic crisis that that I was a piker. And that all the guys I worked with in the technology industry were absolute amateurs at this compared to the financial industry and uh, K Street lobbyists in general. Right? <laughs> what, what I was doing on Microsoft's behalf is done orders of magnitude better, more cleverly, more efficiently, with more money by Washington lobbyists. Yes. Uh, if they want to, so for example, one of the things I brought to Microsoft's evangelism was for them to think a little bit less about the technology, not to totally focus on the technology and think about the individual they were talking to, right? What, did, what were that person's motivations? Because if they were talking to an engineer, it was probably the engineering details, okay? But it was also, the guy wants to be famous, damn it. He's an American, he wants to be famous. It's in our blood, it's part of the culture. He wants to get credit, he wants, because it's, it's, he gets future jobs from that, right? So, Helping that guy write a paper about his new implementation was much more attractive to him than just giving him technical help. If you could do both so that he could be co-authoring one of the earliest papers that other developers would read, that would establish him as a master of his craft, that's worth another 50 grand a year. And it's worth more prestigious jobs to him. So I'm, I'm interested because we, we had a previous podcast uh, where we talked about um, what I what I call cargo culting. Yeah, right. There's way and, too much of that in the world. And and Believe so me, well, you're in Cambodia a lot, where the outer <laughs> form of something is copied, but the inner plumbing is completely absent. So, I, go ahead. Well, so so I'm interested because there, there's definitely this phenomena of you know people with with reputation or people with you know you know, are able to sort of throw together something, um, attract or attract attention with it. Sometimes it's real and sometimes it's not. Um, but, but, you know, you can have these pop-up, pop-up projects, pop-up things that are happening. Um, what do you think about that? How do you tell the, the real ones from the, the ones who somebody's like, oh, I can, you know, I can boost a whole bunch of, of followers or, you know, get that $50,000 raise. So are you familiar with the hype cycle, the technology hype cycle? Uh, the, what Gartner promotes, or is there something right. you think? Yeah, there, I, there I, is I, something. Let me step it back so, and not, not assume that my knowledge is going to translate from, from a listener's yeah. perspective. So um, here I should pull it up on, on Google while we're talking just to make sure I'm not wrong about the details. Um, hype cycle. I obviously did not get ahead in life due to my fast typing. <laughs> Try again. Hi. Cycle. All right, Google. There you go. The hype cycle. Yeah, I just pulled that up in Wikipedia. And the idea is that there's a technological trigger. I'm like reading this right off of uh, Wikipedia here. There's a technological trigger where some technological change enables new thing, some new thing. Okay. And that gets hyped beyond all imagination because like half a dozen startup companies are formed based on the existence of this technology trigger and they all got to raise money. And to raise money, you have to be able to say that although the market for this is small now, it's going to be huge later. And so you inflate everyone's expectations beyond all reason. And since the technology is so new, nobody really understands it. Nobody can refute any of your claims. All of the different companies, startup companies that were based on this, haven't proven anything yet. And so there's this huge hype surrounding this new potential. 
But eventually reality kicks in. Eventually you've got to have electronics, you've got to have software, it has to perform, has to meet certain uh, service level agreements or, or performance standards or cost trigger something. And so then you get the trough of disillusionment where, oh, pff, AI is bullshit. I mean, I've, I've seen AI get hyped at least three times in my short career as being the solution to all the world's problems. Or VR, for Christ's sake, we did VR in uh, 1995 with games. And guess what? It made people sick. Not all of them, but some percentage. It throws off their depth perception. All you need is one crash, one car crash, from a kid who just, or a driver who just quit playing some VR game. He sues the VR company, he wins a bunch of money. Guess what? Nobody can sell VR anymore because they're exposing themselves to losses, right? In America, that is the number one technological uh, uh, killer yeah. is That's consumer uh, uh, liability losses. So VR is going to go so nowhere. When it comes to security breaches, apparently the, there's the, the risk of a security breach causing your company to fail is... is uh... <laughs> Exactly. It's not as not as serious, I guess. I don't. I'm scared about. Well, that. Um, I'm looking at you, Equifax. Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. The fact that Equifax is not dead. Okay, we're seeing senators brought down for sexual misconduct, but we're not seeing Equifax brought down for failing at their core function, and in fact, getting a billion dollar contract like two weeks later. Come on. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing the raised eyebrow as hard as I can. I don't know if it comes across in the sound of the podcast. But yeah, that, I don't know why. I, I, pulled, I pulled you, pulled you off, off, off cycle. I, I'm going to resist saying the word Bitcoin. <laughs> and mm. uh, let's get back to hype and disillusionment. <laughs> yeah. So, so really, there's no way to tell which technologies are overhyped and which ones aren't uh, until they've reached a level of maturity that exposes them to the marketplace, right? The market is where the rubber hits the road. That's the beauty of markets. Like, it's not that markets are always right or markets uh, find an optimal solution, but they find a solution, okay? A solution that makes money, that, that spews profits. If it doesn't make profits, it's abandoned, okay? And, and that's not a bad metric because if the solution is wonderful in every respect, but continues to cost vast quantities of money, right? It's like Soviet agriculture, okay? All you're doing is ruining, you know, the country and caught, sucking money out of every other aspect of the economy to where eventually everybody starves and the country collapses. <laughs> I, I, I think you're the first person I've ever heard use Soviet architecture as, or, or agriculture as an analogy, especially in tech. <laughs> Well, one of the advantages of being retired is I can read lots of stuff. So, oh, uh, people point to Chernobyl as the breaking, the thing that broke the Soviet Union's back or the Star Wars thing by Reagan. But when people can't get enough food to eat, okay, that's when they rebel. That's when they say we need a change, when they're on the brink of starvation. The fact that Venezuela's gone this long without a full-scale uh, over uh, popular rebellion is remarkable to me because you got people who are, I mean, the average Venezuelan has lost 17 pounds, you know, something like 20 pounds because of the lack of food. It's not because they're all choosing to go on a diet simultaneously, okay? It's because they don't have enough food to eat. That has not happened in modern times uh, outside, in a democratic country anywhere, okay? Dictatorships have people starve to death because the dictator doesn't give a shit. But in theoretically democratic countries, this is the first time. So, so, Jim, I'm going to take us in a new direction, and and okay, you know, because you come from, rattle, so because fair. you come from uh, pure open, you know, come from the evil world of Microsoft as an open source person. It's still shocking to me that Microsoft is actually very pro open source compared to other companies. But uh, tell me your thinking on open source. I mean, the early days, you know, you were at Microsoft, and I don't want to say you guys were against Linux, but you competed against Linux and you did interesting things to fight it, but has your opinion on open source changed? Do you, do you still, is it different than the proprietary world? I, I'm curious, you're thinking There's a bunch now. of stuff. Open source is fascinating, okay? Open source is fascinating. It is not a surprise to me that open source succeeded first and best in the server world, right? Because the server world is uh, not exposed to consumer pressure in any way. And so much server software up until recently has been one-off, 
right? You, you write a lot of stuff and, and it's running something, it's, it's really specialized stuff. Amazon Web Services changed that, okay? And guess what? They're a proprietary thing that's closed source. And, and, <laughs> um, and I remember this, when I was at Rackspace, I had this debate with another evangelist where he was saying, Amazon Web Services is the API standard. It's the de facto standard. The battle is over. And I was, you know, like, had fiduciary responsibility to say, no, it's not. No, it's not. OpenStack and open source still have a chance. Totally not true. Amazon Web Services was so far ahead of the competition in installed base, developer awareness, tool support, breadth of API, and it was accelerating its gains. But I was required to say, no, it's not. OpenStack, you know, is the coming thing. It's, it's you know, this for number two. What you're seeing is the last corp, that's of a dying corp. You have, you have just defined Cargo Cult for me in a very satisfying way. But oh, yeah? Going. Yes, open source. Go, open source, go ahead. All right, so from Microsoft's perspective, open source is what all of your defeated, failed competitors band together to do once they realize their individual APIs are never going to win. Okay? Because in most API ecosystem competitions, there is a dominant winner. They're all, it's a Ziff's, Ziff's law, a power law. Pull that up on Wikipedia also. Uh, Z-I-P-F, apostrophe S, Zip's law, uh, also called a power law. It's the same thing that leads to the long tail, okay? The key point is that if you rank everybody by market share or revenue or whatever, the number one platform has X dollars. The number two platform has X over two dollars. The number three platform has X over three dollars. The number four and so on down the road, right? It's a very, it, the, the steepness of the curve varies. Maybe it's 2x, 3x, 4x, but the steepness of the curve. That's why there's only, there's only room for three or four competitors. That's right. That's right. Everybody else talks about the niche they're in, but that's, that's just because the door hasn't shut on them completely yet. Okay. The door is closing. The, the wall is coming. They're just trying to find some niche. Um, uh, what's an example? Blackberry still exists in some form somewhere. There is some niche of people for whom BlackBerry is still the operating system they prefer. It hasn't been a contender. It's the chance of it becoming number one anywhere, it, or you know, globally, is zero. Right? But within some small niche, there's enough of an ecosystem to keep it going a little while longer until the door closes completely and Android or so that translates into open source because what you're saying is is that the the three four five vendors in these spaces can basically capture can threaten number one or number two by banding together use it with correct pressure okay right the other thing to recognize is that it's a time buying strategy okay so ibm eventually realized it had no server strategy Think how amazing that is for IBM, the big iron enterprise software company, to have no cloud services strategy, right? If there was anybody who should have been jumping into that with both feet as soon as Amazon released uh, S3, its first cloud service, it would have been Amazon, uh, IBM. And there were probably individual engineers at IBM who were saying, this, this Amazon Web Services thing, this is going to fucking kill us if we don't jump on it right now in 2007. Right. Yeah, I, 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 was in, I was in conversations like that. And what, they, what the conversation usually went with was, don't worry about that. This is an engineer, classic engineer. The quality, performance, reliability, X, whatever thing engineer cares about is so crappy, so below par with Amazon that it will not be a threat to us. Mm -hmm. um, that is, the Amazon thing was so low compared to the IBM solution that the Amazon stuff was not a threat. Is that what you meant? Right. Yeah. We actually did a podcast about that, the Post Gardener one we did about um, disruptive, yeah. uh, where where things started at very low barriers, very low entry, don't appear to threaten the incumbents, and right. then basically eat their lunch um, from the bottom up. Yeah, classic Clayton Christensen innovators dilemma. Classic. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. So, well, you know, I read Clayton Christensen stuff when it first came out in the mid-90s, and there was some stuff by uh, 
Brian Arthur on increasing returns to path dependence. And again, Microsoft was being sued for antitrust problems, right? And so we had to say, no, there's no such thing as increasing returns to path dependency. That's absolutely not true. While we were actively doing everything we could to make everything as path dependent as possible, because we understood the increasing returns to path dependency. You know, they were exposing our game plan to the rest of the world that didn't understand it. Right? Uh, Freaking Apple. Apple was so stupid. It was so frustrating to work there. Their low-level engineers were awesome. And some of their product design guys were awesome. But their management sucked after Steve Jobs left and before he returned. Okay? Steve Jobs may have been a bad manager in many respects, but he knew what people would buy. Right? Yes. He knew what people would pay top dollar to put in their pockets, put in their ears, whatever. It had a great sense for that. Um, more than one Apple president referred to third-party developers privately, but in my presence, as blood-sucking parasites who were hitching a ride on Apple's beautiful product. Okay, And that's peripheral makers, that's third-party software developers, anybody who was making a dime from Apple's beautiful product was a parasite, not a symbiotic member of the ecosystem that Apple should encourage to grow, but a parasite. Okay. And, and Steve Jobs always felt that way. Always. When we were at the next day, the day, first day the uh, next machine was introduced, the machine he created after the Macintosh, after he got kicked out of Apple was next computer. And he introduced, introduced it first on Wall Street to the financial guys. And the day after, the next day, get it? He had a presentation in Silicon Valley, third party software developers begging them to support the next machine. And the software was awesome. It was the object, it was developed in uh, Objective-C, right, dynamic language. It had uh, all these kits that you could use. It wasn't just APIs, it was object-oriented stuff that was really easy to leverage. We were all slavering at the mouth. And then he said, oh, by the way, you don't have to worry about product distribution. We'll do that for you. And somebody said, wait, what? Raised his hand and said, what do you mean you'll handle product distribution for us? Oh, you'll send us your new version of the software and every quarter we'll release an optical worm drive, right? A, a CD DVD, that has all the latest software on it. And what's that gonna cost us? And another guy says, fuck what it costs us. It means they have us by the balls, right? We can't ship anything they don't approve of. And everybody, if you've ever seen that uh, famous political cartoon from the 1870s, where everybody's pointing in a circle saying it's his fault to the guy to the left, so it's, it all comes back to they're all pointing at each other, <laughs> right? And so we were there saying, after you, no, after you, no, after you, after you. I'm not, you know, none of us chose to invest in Next software because we didn't want to have our distribution be controlled by Steve Jobs. Oh, and he only wanted 30% off the top for the privilege of controlling our software distribution. So he managed so, to win that fight once he got once with the iPhone. Because that's right. That's the wall garden that we that that's, they created with the app store. How did how did that how did he win on that one? I guess the, the cell phones. Sorry. People in the internet space were stupid as shit about um, phones. They were resistant to the idea of exploiting the native features of a given phone. Right. There were a bunch of internet-based APIs proposed to uh, access the native features of an API so that they, you could write it, an app that was an internet-based app using internet-based standards, HTML5, all that kind of stuff, that would reach down into the phone and deal with its motion sensor, its speakers, its microphone, all the things that are built into the phone and are exposed by its native API. Remember, that's what Apple originally proposed software developers do for the, for the iPhone, was write internet-based apps. The idea of writing native apps was deprecated initially, and developers beat them into doing it because the internet-based apps did not reach down into the specifics of the phone properly. And once Apple realized this, they started doing in the open source meetings what I did when I was a Microsoft guy at the open source standards meeting, which is say no to everything, say it requires more time to study, drag my feet, delay, 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 delay. 
You're right? evil. Since, <laughs> it's the practical thing to do because you just slow the open source standard until you can come out with a proprietary a thing that's equivalent or better. And so Apple eventually did that. They eventually opened up their tools and their API and everything so that you could write native code apps or native uh, API apps rather than going through the internet approach because it, it locked people in. Right? You remember initially they said you couldn't use third party, AP, third party APIs, third party uh, tools. You know, you had to do it totally within and the they world. Would, they, would scrub, they would scrub your app six ways to Sunday. That's right. They would uh, do a code analysis to make sure you weren't using any offending APIs or libraries. So, so Apple did that quite deliberately. Uh, and even Google did not push the open source alternative quickly enough because they thought, hey, we're going to win market share all over the world with Android. What with it being free? Right? Um, and so everything got divided between Android and iOS. Uh, with the things that come out first in the US being iOS focused, with the things that come out pretty much in the rest of the world being Android focused. And Android is eventually going to eat Apple's lunch, uh, especially now that Steve Jobs is dead and the unified command. I mean, Steve Jobs had the ability to say to Apple, you all may think this is the wrong thing, but this is what we're going to do anyway because I'm Steve fucking Jobs and you're not. <laughs> and he could do that. Bill, Bill Gates the same way. Once you've hit home runs out of the park, you know, four or five times that have saved the company, if you say, we're going to go kill baby harp seals, you know, as a public relations stunt, and you insist on it, pretty much the company's got to go along with it because you have such a track record of success, even if it is the stupidest idea that's going to blow up in your face and everyone can see it but you, you're Steve fucking Jobs and, and you can get it done, okay? Nobody at Apple has that anymore. Tim Cook, you know, if he took that idea of slaughtering baby harp seals as a public relations stunt to the board, they'd say he's lost it, he's out of here. You know, we're gonna put some other bean counter in charge, right? So. So, Jim, I, I do have an interesting question. Um, so one of the things is, you know, Microsoft, even Microsoft got caught as the internet rose and Google rose. And, and, and if you look at social media, I mean, Facebook came out of nowhere. So competition always could come up and take these companies on. But it looks now as we've reached the point where the companies like the Facebooks and the Googles and the Microsofts and Apples, they've learned and they've seen it. So what they do now is they just buy anything that might potentially get them and either shut it down or absorb it have we reached a point where you that these big companies are so powerful that you can't innovate against them because they'll block it because they have so much money uh there's no no and no let me give different reasons why that's no in all cases Sorry, first man. first there's china i don't know how much business you guys have done in china however much it is you need to double it okay because the things happening in china you know I'm 57. You guys are in your 40s? Yes. Late. <laughs> okay. So over the, uh, I was 13 when Nixon went to China and opened the place up, 12, 13. And that was a huge geopolitical coup. It's one of the only things Kissinger ever did right. Uh, I say in a company that, in a country that uh, uh, Kissinger convinced Nixon to bomb the shit out of. Hmm. Uh, that still kills at least a dozen people. Well, actually, it's dropped a little bit. Half a dozen people every month here in From Cambodia bombs. are killed by unexploded, previously unexploded bombs and landmines. Imagine if a dozen people were being killed every month in the United States, and he scaled that up for the vast disparity in population, it would be more like 50 or 60, right? Uh, and that, that's just what happens in the background, right? Um, it's like lightning strikes or something, you know? Anyway, so uh, China. So China is not, having been raised in an, in an environment where my parents would tell me, finish your plate because there are people starving in China. You should be grateful for the fact that you have food on your plate because you know half the people in China are starving. That was true then. 30 million people died on the great leap forward from starvation. Uh, but now it is a rich and prosperous and innovative company or country, rather. I always get company and country confused because, you know, that's the way my loyalties go. Um, 
you may not be able to innovate politically in China, but the deal they made after Tiananmen Square was make all the money you want, right? Be an entrepreneur. Don't think about politics. Don't think about the environment. Don't think about being an activist. Make money. Find a way to make money. And so they are innovative sons of bitches in China, and they have every reason to be. And their market is so huge that they don't give a shit about expanding outside of China most of the time. They got a billion people in their market. That's three times the United States. That's bigger than the United States and Europe put together. Okay, so the developed world hardly has a billion people in it all together. So they don't give a shit about exporting, generally speaking, until they have come to dominate the Chinese market. And once they come to dominate the Chinese market and figure out marketing, they're going to put Apple and those other guys to shame. Well, Alibaba is a great example, right? I mean, yeah. Alibaba, I think they made 20 or $30 billion in one day a few weeks ago, yeah. just as a yeah. one day sale. sale. And Amazon on like Black Monday made $3 billion. So they're already 10 times bigger. They have a cloud coming. But that's right. So they're coming after Amazon, but I don't think we see that. Exactly. Exactly my point is that in the West, we get all tied up about what Donald Trump is doing and Putin is doing and, and Amazon is doing and Apple is doing. And meanwhile, in China, you can't see my hand gestures here, but in China, I'm pointing off stage. The, the, the shit is hitting the fan as far as the West is concerned, and you're not even aware of it. But, but it's, you can't go into China. I mean, it's very difficult to go into China and try to compete as a non-Chinese company. I agree. But to ignore China, to pay no attention to what is happening there, is complete suicide over the course of the next 10 years. Not necessarily the last 10 years. The last 10 or 20 years, you could essentially ignore China and survive just fine. Google did. Mm -hmm. right? Google's not really hurting for the consequence of it. But when the Chinese competitor that the absence of Google enabled starts spreading outside of China, it'll take over all of the third world, all of the rest of the world before the developed world figures this out. Like air conditioners, here's a great example, air conditioners, okay? The West makes great air conditioners for big frickin' houses because that's what the West has. Great big frickin' houses, five bedroom homes with parlors and, and dens and whatever, okay? Uh, the Chinese specialize in making little tiny super efficient air conditioners for one room, one room, if that's what people can afford. They can't afford the electricity to run the air conditioner to heat a great big house. And they don't have a great big house, they have one room. Or they have a bunch of rooms and they only wanna cool the bedroom so they can sleep. Well, once you've really optimized the shit out of air conditioners that can cool one room, it's really easy to scale those up to larger size, right? This is a classic innovator's dilemma example. They're starting at a market that, that is totally underserved by the West's products. The West's baseline price point is so high compared to what people in developing countries can afford that the West's products are completely uninteresting completely uninteresting and for and, the west and, and the cost of the cost of sale the entry point so what what you're describing for from that perspective is that the thought process that goes into a product for and uh for uh, i won't even classify it asian or chinese marketplace but for 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 the for a, a non-western market the the entry point the adoption the, the way it operates is optimized so differently. Yes. I mean, even for us, like when we when we go into market, we look at, you know, a cost of sale that's you know thousands of dollars at, as a minimum. We couldn't survive in a market where we had you know hundreds of thousands of, of, of accounts. It has to be near zero entry point, highly right. repeatable, low friction. Um, so that that brings me actually. And, and I know, Stephen, you're let looking me, at the go on that point, let me give you some actual data on that. Yeah. The uh, average per capita income in the United States is about $50,000 per year, right? Per capita income, 50000 a year. Now, most people aren't making that. That's the average. And it means it's really pulled up by the amounts the 1% make. Okay? But nonetheless, the average per capita income 
is 50,000 a year. And the average lifespan in the United States is now about 80 years, of which mm, 50 are productive, right, in terms of earning a living. So that's 50 times 50 is a really big number. Uh, 2.5 million, I think. Okay. So the average lifetime earnings of an American citizen are about $2.5 million. Now let's look at an equivalent calculation in the United States, or in Cambodia. The average per capita income in Cambodia is roughly $1,000 a year. And their life expectancy is more like 60 years, of which 40 are expected to be productive. So that's $40,000 in total lifetime earnings, less than one year's earnings in the United States. So the amount of tax revenue that can be taken out of a Cambodian person over the course of his life is so much smaller than the amount of tax revenue that can be taken out of an American citizen's life that Cambodia cannot afford anything like the infrastructure that the US has. It can't afford roads, can't maintain them, let alone build them. It can't afford schools, it can't afford hospitals, it can't afford jack or squat. It means that if somebody gets killed in an industrial accident, the payout for his lost lifetime earnings has a cap of about $40,000, not a legal cap, but a mathematical calculation cap, and is probably much less than that. So it's, you know, life is cheap in Cambodia, literally, life is cheap. And yet, the, the, the people who live on the farm in the rice fields the globalized price of rice has fallen below the cost of production. So if you plant a crop of rice to sell, you're losing money. The price has come up a little bit in the last year or so, so it's not quite as bad as it was recently. But there are farmers who are hanging themselves because there were three bad years of drought. They borrowed money against their farmland to try to get one good year. Then there was a fantastic year, of perfect weather, perfect rain. But then everybody had a bumper crop, so the price fell, right? So they still weren't able to pay off their debt. They lost their land. They were hopeless. They killed themselves. Okay, it's surprisingly common. So, all right, now I have to unwind the stack here. I went down that rat hole. Uh, ah, okay, so making money, coming up with a profitable thing, cost of entry. The, the total lifetime value of an American consumer is huge. Right? The total lifetime value of a Cambodian consumer is trivial. It's below your cost of entry. It's not worth acquiring in most cases, unless you're targeting the 1% of Cambodians, many of whom are ridiculously rich. Okay? So it's given me a whole different perspective on consumer products. But China, going back to China, popping the stack one level higher. This is like watching Inception. Um, <laughs> Uh, going back to China, so China had that type of internal consumer market for decades where it had to target poor consumers because that's all they had. But that's given them the technology and the business infrastructure to go into Africa, to go into Southeast Asia, go into Latin America and kick the asses of American, French, German companies because their cost structure is just so low all across the supply chain. So that is... So, so yeah. I'm sorry, I have Rob, one question, Stephen, before you, you out, you outro us. Yeah, I could talk to Jim for hours, but we will have no, to stop. <laughs> um, so, so does open source, right? Air quotes, free software change that dynamic? Cause I, I know in the U S we're struggling with the idea that, you know, you can take open source software and you can put it in production and never pay anybody for it, which, it essentially bankrupts the open source software. Um, exactly. Where where does this where does that equation come out? Right. Somebody somebody either you know you're going to have super inexpensive Asian. Um, I don't like to say Asian. It's just super inexpensive, low cost. Okay, emerging economy, places. developing world. But but they don't but they don't build software. Or as far as I can tell, they haven't been building and maintaining software in a way that is sustainable from an open source perspective. Um, what I had expected to see by now, but haven't seen, is for China to really embrace open source by cloning and forking the, the best open source stuff and paying some of their top developers to work on it. 
and having the Chinese government just pay, thinking that software is to the Chinese software economy what electricity and roads and dams, you know, it's just essential infrastructure. And that especially in a nominally communist country, for the government to just bear the cost of developing that infrastructure, in this case, code infrastructure, so, say for example, a public cloud, a totalitarian state would love to have everybody put all their personal information on the cloud so that they can observe it, you know, uh, analyze it and potentially block it or alter it at their will. Uh, and that's true whether the totalitarian state is the Communist People Party or the GOP. So, <laughs> having, but, they, having, but Jim, they, I mean, there is massive amounts of open source development in, in China. I know that when I was on um, working on Zen and uh, yeah. you know, we had so many, so Intel had one guy that would check in code and everyone was like, well, you know, this one guy's doing a good amount of code. And then when I found out that I said, hey, you know what, Intel, let's hold an event in China. I think you have some developers there. And they go, yeah, they had like 400 developers actually behind the scenes working on the open source Zen. And OpenStack's right. largest community of developers are in China, in uh, Beijing. And so I think open source has massive amounts of Chinese and they're using it to build their companies and to compete. And, right. and they're taking advantage of big companies here in America that don't quite get what they're doing by handing everything into open source. Because they're yeah. desperate and at position three, four, and five, like we talked about earlier, to compete. And they're actually putting themselves out of business quicker by giving their future competition the jewels, I guess. Yep. Um, Western democracy is based on the idea that winning elections provides legitimacy to governments. Asian governments are on a completely different system. They have what they call the uh, uh, ec economic, legitima economic legitimacy. As long as the economy is doing well, growing at five, six, eight percent a year, then everybody's making so much money they don't give a shit about political freedom. Okay. A few dissidents always will, but uh, as long as you're making enough well, money, yes. you're good to go, all right? Uh, and that's fine, as long as you keep growing above the necessary rate, and as long as that growth is fairly evenly distributed across society. But as soon as there are big pockets that aren't participating in the growth anymore, you see that legitimacy called away. <clears throat> American Midwest, <clears throat> right? So you know, there are many lessons to be learned for the West by experiencing Asian culture for a while, for living in Asia for a while. It really changes your perspective, and I highly recommend it. So, so the, they used to say that, you know, I remember 10 years ago, you want your children to know how to speak Chinese, and that kind of went away. So what you're telling me is my 10 and 11-year-old do need to go learn Chinese, and I bet they get it. Absolutely. Uh, the thing is, <laughs> lots and lots of Chinese are learning English uh, well, yes. because – it is the business language of the world, okay? Uh, and they're learning a lot about America by learning to speak English. For example, in Khmer, Cambodia's language, the verbs are different depending on the status you, you're saying to someone. If I'm speaking to you and you are lower status than me and I'm inviting you to join me for food, I say, hop by, okay? But if you're equal to me, I say, nyan by. If you're higher than me, I say, chan by. Buy is rice. All those other verbs are eat. Okay, and there's even more for monks. You say pizza buy, and the king is a whole different thing, right? So, so status is built into the language. So you can't separate the status hierarchy of society from anything you say or do. That and we don't is how. Get that. Don't get that at all. We don't right, understand. That. Japan freaks us out, and I've been to Japan. I've been to China. Japan freaks us out because their their hierarchical structure is just too confusing. All right, uh, Jim, Rob, you, we have to stop because this is <laughs> it's just Jim. It has been so much fun to catch up with it's you. So late and, where you are. What time is it there? Well, it's nine for Rob. I, I live in the mountains, so it's only eight for me. But, <laughs> yeah, because um, you're nine, right. I ran away from Austin. It's too hot and too crowded. So I'm hiding in the mountains. But um, Jim, it has certainly been a, a real pleasure to have you on this podcast. Um, we certainly like to stay in touch. And I think uh, as the you know, technology keeps moving, 
Um, I think we'll certainly uh, bring you in in a couple of months again, if you're more than welcome to join us again. And, but, I, but I think the history that you bring about how Microsoft and everyone competed and, and you know, all these things we take for granted that you know, were built, were thought out and done is, is quite remarkable. And as someone who built a developer program for Citrix in the late 90s before there was any such concept, I understand. I, of course, was nowhere near as skilled as you because no one thinks of uh, Citrix. I, I learned from the best at Microsoft. <laughs> but but uh, we watched you. So thank you again for joining us and to our listeners. I hope you enjoyed this. This is certainly uh, not your typical podcast. And uh, we're really thrilled to have uh, Jim with, you, with us today. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. And I'd be happy to come back and talk about how you can apply ecosystem thinking to non-technology fields, things outside of the norm. And before Broaden your audience. audience, Jim. Before you go, I we do there there we do want to let people know how they can hear more about this. Um, I believe there's a book. There is. Like and so so we should we should definitely let let users know where they can they can read more, learn more, uh, and interact with you a little bit more. Indeed, and uh, Russell Demaria, I can send you that text. I think. Uh, You've already yeah, we, got that. We have it. We'll put it in the blog, but for the listeners who are in their car. Right. Yeah, be sure to put it at the top of the, the, the yeah. text. So it's easy to find. Russell DeMaria spent 10 years writing a book about the history of the uh, Xbox, how the Xbox came to be, and the history of the developer relations group that fed into the history of the Xbox. And those books are called Game of X, Volume 1 and 2. I am quoted extensively in Volume 2. And uh, they're on Amazon Kindle, cheap download if you have Amazon Unlimited, which I highly recommend, uh, 10 bucks a month. Uh, they're available free. And you should all go buy that book and pay Russell Demaria some money because he worked his ass off to make those books happen. You'll learn a lot. Thanks. Hey, right, thanks again. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign off. Thank you, everyone. All right, everybody. Good night. Later. Bye-bye.